gamble or just cross that bridge if we end up coming to it? Uh, like in, in regards to why I'm kind of low energy and shit, like let, letting the audience know, hey, I just spent two weeks with fucking COVID. Which you could have already just done because you know me, I'm always recording <laughs> when, right. when pretty much as soon as I dial. This one was just a little bit afterward, but yeah, you could say that. Uh, if if you like, you know, I don't push anybody to s- spread their personal business unless they feel like it. Uh, as as I have told you, there are some people that have been on here after recovering from COVID, COVID and they said it on the recording. And there are other people who didn't, not for some weird thing, but just because some things people keep closer to their got closer to their chest with uh, with a respiratory disease that was not meant to be a, a connection like that no pun intended yeah no no pun intended i mean fuck it i, I let i mean we can just jump right into it yeah this is uh this is episode two of the uh the, the does this does this have a different name or is this just still a a, a side project kind of deal for psycho semantic cast this is yeah. the second co- comic book movie show that we've done here so far. Yeah, we're trying to come up with something a little bit more concise than the series of comic book movie shows we're doing for Psycho Semantic for the Legion Patreon, which will almost always end up being in the regular feed eventually. That's that that's hard to put on a T-shirt or a poster. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, so we're th- this month we're taking a little break from the Marvel stuff, which... Uh, I think since the last time, since we recorded that Captain America, there has been two Marvel movies that have come out in that span of time, Shang-Chi and Eternals. Eternals was one of the last things I did before I contracted fucking COVID in the, in the same day we went to the theater, which was opening weekend. Uh, we sat, you know, away from away from most people. There was me, m- my fiance and one of her friends. Uh, and I saw Eternals, which I like quite a bit. We'll get we'll get back to that later on this series at some point uh my the long and short of it is i think it's a great like marvel movie for grown-ups it's kind of the polar opposite of like the like tom holland spider-man movies which i think are very much directed at like teenagers and kids and stuff eternals is like the first mcu movie that i felt was like truly kind of trying to shed itself of its uh you know pulpiness it's it's uh, which I, I think is reflective of like, you know, the, I, I haven't read a lot of Eternals, like the, the actual comics, but I think they came out in a time where people were a little burnt out on the kitty stuff and they wanted something a little more grown up, which is that that's pretty much what Eternals is. It's uh, uh, I, I liked it quite a bit. It's it's not super deep, but it also doesn't you know, it's not catering to all the dum dums in the crowd that need everything spoon fed to them, basically. Uh, and the other one was Shang Chi, which I had a lot of fun with. That was basically just like the biggest budget martial arts movie I think I've ever seen. Uh, it's got some, it's got some cool action. It's, it's, it's a, it's a decent uh, MCU origin story that has almost nothing to do with uh, any of the rest of the movies. You can kind of jump in at Shang Chi, and you don't really need to know. There, there are one or two parts which I won't spoil if there's people who haven't seen it. It is on disney the d plus at time of recording this but uh yeah shang chi was a lot of fun too it's got some pretty rad action scenes in it um but this 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 go around we're taking take a little break from the mcu uh i think we'd originally intended to do this episode in october be mostly my my reasoning was mostly because the movie at least takes place on devil's night which is the night before halloween you're 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 a big folklore dude uh, I, I mean i guess we can you, you've probably seen the title of this episode which is the crow we're going to be talking about the, the james O'Barr comics and the uh 1993 i think film starring brandon lee um but uh yeah we'd originally intended to do this in october and mostly that's because of devil's night you uh explain real quick to the, the kids at home what the hell devil's night is since it's not really something that's actually practiced i don't think anymore thank god yeah okay so yeah devil's night is sort of a, a regional thing some parts of america and other places it's mostly in the united states as far as i was aware there's you know philadelphia and all actually i don't know if the, the thing the article i looked up was just watching the crow but they said in Detroit, where the crow takes place, right, 
it is associated with acts of serious vandalism and arson since the late 1960s, which sort of has uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to it in, in a little bit. But I mean, Detroit is a heavy influence on this comic. Uh, that's where yeah. James, James O'Barr, the guy that wrote and drew the comic, grew up the characters' names, except for maybe the crow, <laughs> but more like the Tin Tin and Top Dollar and all that shit were names that he saw in graffiti when he was going around the city. And, you know, all the streets and intersections and shit were from his memory from when that happened. Fucking uh, Eric the Crow, his his body and physicality is based on Iggy Pop, who is also Michigan, uh, a product of Michigan. So there's, yeah. Um, so that, that's basically Devil's Night is the chaos before Halloween. It's can be it can happen in lots of places, but it actually is called that regionally in some places, particularly Detroit and, and whatnot, like I said. And as far as I know, I kind of think the whole Devil's Night thing really mostly only plays in the movie and not so much in the book. I didn't actually. The so the the original back issues there's there's three uh, like trade paperbacks I think of the crow that originally appeared those are very 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 hard to find there is a collection of these that you can get off of Amazon I think for like Kindle it was like sixteen bucks and the collected like print version of that's like about twenty bucks I didn't get a chance to go back and read that obviously because the last like almost two weeks i've been like fairly bedridden and a little short on cash from not working or whatnot there is a whole slew of crow comics that are available uh that came a little afterwards a lot of them like from idw and i think dark horse did a bunch of crow comics uh you can you can find those on comiXology and they're like free to borrow or whatnot if you are on their you know amazon prime like uh, payment deal with comiXology so uh, i did get a chance to read a few of those 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 are very interesting and very similar and uh I think here and there james abar contributed to those but uh yeah the original ones are a little a little more tricky to track down <laughs> right at the moment but um because those were those were released by caliber comics uh starting january 1989 and there were four four issues and then a fifth one added a little bit later like as a epilogue uh like the death of eric draven and then right. yeah, all the other stuff afterwards uh, i ended up watching about a 45 minute interview with james obar a little while after the movie had come out i forget what the date was from but he specifically says in the thing that he's now 40 so whenever <laughs> from whatever that was whenever he turned whenever he was 40 but he was in his uh little basement or downstairs drawing area kind of him talking at the camera and uh you know it starts right. out he's telling everybody or the the person in the house to be quiet because he's gonna be talking and then yeah he goes on talking about this um you know, like he fell in love with a girl that Shelley is based on and when he was 16. And when they, right after high school or right around the time high school was ending, she was killed by a drunk driver. He said pretty much the, uh, what's her real name? In real life, her name was Beverly. But he said Shelley is a copy of her. And uh, he did Eric Draven as I forget who he said uh, his face looked like, but he said his physicality and his body was based off Iggy Pop because he didn't like to draw himself. And it was all therapeutic. You know, he was basically thinking about killing himself and he drew the comic instead, but he had to stop every couple pages. That's why he said the chapters are four to five or uh, five to ten pages long because he just had to like, like do it and he said it took him something like nine years to do the series right and what one of the reasons why i got to this was uh caliber comics that was like a guy at a comic book shop 
where he hung out <laughs> that liked the t-shirt designs that he sold for him, and he asked him if he could do, like, a comic strip and publish it. So that's why that shit's always hard to find, because it was, like, some fucking punk rock label. And, um... <laughs> uh, yeah and i i think i read the original yeah the original prints of those were there there were they did a couple of you know really really small like probably a few hundred of each issue or whatever and then there would be reprints but it was never more than like a thousand on the a thousand new copies on the on the reprint so uh yeah good 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 luck tracking down those original comics thankfully they've been reprinted a few times and they're they're floating around uh, I, I did. I did watch a little bit of a documentary on YouTube that I found. Those basically just two huge comic nerds like going through the, uh, the 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 collected version of the the original. You know, you know, four four three or four issues or whatnot. And uh, yeah, definitely one thing you can. Uh, well, you're you're talking about how long this took to uh, get finished. You can definitely tell the art style progresses like like there's more and more like different tricks that kind of come out as as the, as the issues go on like chronologically almost you know there, there's a lot of it's at the beginning is fairly simple just like black and white you know it, it, it all all the issues are black and white of this original run but like yeah the original is a lot of just like fairly basic ink drawings um largely inspired uh, they, they they pointed out a lot of comparisons to like the the Frank Miller stuff that was coming out at the time and like some Alan Moore stuff, um, just just in the kind of art style and how how uh, stuff was drawn kind of. But as as you go on, the art gets like a lot more complicated and there's different you know combinations of uh, you know stuff stuff like watercolors and crosshatch and all these all these different art styles and you can definitely tell that the dude progressed quite a bit as an artist as this book went on which i think is kind of neat it would be cool to go to go through the the comics uh because i'm a bit more into comics now than i was when the movie came out right and then finding more stuff out about the creation of the comic and the the stuff that I mean, there's so many, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into it when we talk about the movie, which we did watch instead of the comic book that we tried to find issues of, but, <laughs> but you know, he was, he, the way he describes himself uh, when he was 16 or so when, uh, as a teenager sort of, exemplifies a lot of the people I knew in high school who were really into this movie. Right. And stuff. And also some of the things that happened in his life translate directly into the comic book and the movie. And I know he, he was pretty happy with the, the way the, the movie ended up. Uh, he, he was said something about how there was one producer and he thought he was joking, but a producer was talking about, making it a musical and having Michael Jackson play the crow. Oh my God. And he just freaked out <laughs> after he found out he was serious. And he's like, why can't somebody just make my comic like it into a movie like it's supposed to be? Cause I'm a big movie fan and I drew the comic sort of like storyboards. And I, I think it would be good like that. And uh, he was pretty happy with the people that took over the project and made everything that way. But he he did mention one thing as the way he liked to look at it, especially with the uh, the sequels. I actually I have never seen one of the sequels. I don't know. If well, I watched one of them for this the, oh. the second one. Is that <laughs> well, the City we'll of get... Angels? Uh huh. We'll we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that here in a minute because I got a little, at least a little bit to say about that fucking movie. Okay. He said, and having seen the sequel, maybe you'll appreciate this a little bit more. He said that he likes to think about way back in the day, somebody asked Raymond Chandler what he thought of what Hollywood did to his books. And he said, they haven't done anything to my books. They're all right there on the shelf. What they did with the movie is what they did with the movie. Right. Um, Huge point of contention with comic book artists and and the Hollywood kind of. I mean, just look at fucking poor Alan Moore and like what what they did to his fucking babies, and you can kind of understand why you know, especially 
smaller indie artists that, you know, their, their book was like a, a, you know, like a passion project and they put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into it. And then they make a fucking awful movie based on, based off of it. It's, it's like, I can understand why a lot of artists would be a little gun shy to even like entertain the idea. I mean, the money I'm sure is super tempting. Cause I'm sure, you know, they don't, the, the original artists, that's another thing. They, they tend to get fucked over a lot when, uh, the, the their characters and stuff they they created makes the leap to the silver screen um that that happens way more than it probably should but um yeah i i think maybe not at this point when the crow is coming out there wasn't really a lot of good examples this was a few years after uh tim burton's batman movie had come out and made a bazillion dollars um but yeah this was kind of one of the earlier comic book adaptions which is kind of wild to think about because it's, I mean, a little, little baby book done by one guy, you know, printed in super small prints, but, had, you know, gained enough of a cult following kind of that uh, eventually the, the movies were optioned and, you know, Miramax uh, had hired producers and directors and stuff to, to, you know, bring it, bring it to life basically. Um but yeah, this movie could have turned out a lot fucking different. I mean, I, I suddenly was remembering the uh, attempted a Fantastic Four movie that Roger Corman had made, like even a few years prior to uh, Tim Burton's Batman movie, and that was so fucking bad that they buried it and then never came out. And you can only find it in dodgy bootlegs at comic book conventions now. <laughs> but yeah, I could I could understand where Barr was would be coming from if he was like a little nervous about them like bringing this to the big screen because not only were there not a lot of i guess this is a weird time in comics we should probably talk about that kind of the early 90s was like kind of uh i i, I would i would feel fairly confident in saying the early 90s was kind of really the punk rock era of comic books and when things like took a really drastic turn and i think a lot of that has to do with you know the the publishers are probably looking at what they're actual demographics for people that were buying comics at the time were and it was a lot of a lot of kids that had grown up in the 70s and 80s that now had a little bit more disposable income and had kind of a craving for more you know aimed at adults kind of comic books like this is a few probably around the time he started writing it was wasn't too far after uh frank miller well first he had his long run on daredevil which uh, I think took that character in a definite, a definite different direction than a lot of stuff that Marvel had been putting out. Just a lot more violence, a lot more. Uh, everything just felt kind of grungier, and uh, eventually the uh, the Frank Miller Batman comics, like Dark Knight Returns, had come out like late '80s, kind of. And I think that was a huge, huge turning point for comics in general and like that book was such a humongous success and was so critically acclaimed that all the other publishers were like well i guess comics really aren't just like for kids anymore and we can start writing stuff that's a little more adult oriented and this like weirdly is when i really kind of started getting into comics it was the early 90s and i remember really specifically the uh the the ongoing batman series that came out like around this time this was like after bane has broken bruce wayne's back he's basically like a paraplegic that doesn't really do a whole lot and he hires new batman uh who is like way more brutal and way more violent in the books like not just in story but in you know the terms of the art uh like kind of reflected the, this this very dark turn that a lot of these books took not not everything i remember the spider-man comics are still pretty kid friendly around this time and a lot of stuff marvel's putting out but uh there's there's also like this big resurgence of indie comic publishers that were kind of coming out of the woodwork this is around the time that todd mcfarland started image comics once he left his he, he's another one his run on uh the spider-man books with marvel is all the art the art style is very weird and gangly and just kind of gross and strange looking <laughs> and the, the, the stories the stories got considerably darker and 
Yeah, this is yeah, roughly around the same time that Todd, Todd McFarlane f- fucked off from Marvel and then started Image Comics and started writing Spawn, which has a very very similar story to The Crow. I mean, it's basically about somebody that is killed wrongfully and you know has some sort of uh, agreed to, agreement with you know <laughs> the powers on the other side, and they come back from the dead kind of for revenge. It's it's very similar. The books themselves are very very different. I have read a lot of the early Spawn comics, and like even just the art style is like it's like speaking a different language. Basically, it's 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 colorful. It's it's kind of a grotesque like you know uh, it, it's kind of his take on superhero stuff, and like oh it's has got this weird grotesque kind of uh, angle to it. But uh, the crow is kind of kind of a different beast. It, it really kind of like you know even even these newer ones that IDW put out that I was reading are all have like a very a lot more grounded kind of feel and look to them. Like uh, they, they largely I think stuck with the black and white, which I think lends itself to kind of its uh, the gothic nature of the story and the art and. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's just a really interesting time in comics, like where everything. And I was I was young. I mean, in 1993, I would have been seven years old. So, the, the, thankfully, this was still a time when you could get comic books at like the grocery store, and I didn't have to. We had like a hobby shop, I think, that sold comics in my town. But uh, that's not true. There there was also like a gaming store that like primarily I think sold you know dice and dungeons and dragons and warhammer and stuff like that but they also had comics so i kind of bounced between the three as and as far as like buying actual physical copies of comics back then and yeah a lot of it was that that run of batman that was the uh, i think fans jokingly refer to it as the pointy ear era of batman his, his ears on his cowl just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and uh yeah everything was just like super weird and grotesque and dark and uh i i think a lot of that inspired you know my 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 taste in art and film and stuff like that in general because this was uh i mean this is where you would get these kind of stories like there wasn't a lot of movies or tv shows being made that had this kind of tone to it uh obviously video games were so fucking crude at this point that like you weren't really uh the storytelling wasn't really a thing in video games at that point so kind of where i think a lot of us turned to is comics and you would get you know something outside the realms of traditional storytelling and traditional art and it kind of appealed to the weirdo outsiders the the angsty goth kids much much like eric draven himself so um yeah, that's uh, that's about i mean you're you're pretty close to the same age as me you're you're like a year a few years older the me what were i mean do, do you did you have kind of similar experience with comics like in the early 90s or because i i know you eventually like were you got exposed to a lot of comics by having band practice at a comic shop but like what was your like experience like before that kind of with comics before that yeah it was the early thousands when we started practicing at the comic book shop and that's when i sort of got a little bit more back into it. I mean, I, I kind of grew up around comics a little bit. I, my dad had a lot of old ones from the sixties, like the stuff R. Crumb drew for, or stuff like the fabulous furry freak brothers that I think is an animated show on Tubi now. Uh. Three, three stoner dudes. I, I think, I don't even know, like Woody Harrelson, I, I'm guessing, does a voice. I don't know if I'm making that up just because it's Woody Harrelson. but um, And I remember the, the Death of Superman was really big, and I liked those movies and things. And uh, my best buddy's dad is and was a cartoonist, so there was all f- kinds of comics at his house. You know, he had the original, I think... I think it was the book. If not, it was a poster of the cover. But, you know, the original Fantastic Four framed in his drawing room and shit like that. But I I never really got that into the 
regular comics. So I was just kind of aware of stuff and would read random shit. And but the independent things and the image comics things and Marvel zombies, which was much later. But, you know, that stuff sort of brought me back into it when people started experimenting a little bit more, because I think, yeah, uh, some of the older comics that weren't those weird under or odd underground comic things was uh, my dad did have some a couple of the old Batman and Superman fighting each other comics. Right. We were reading those. And uh, my, my parents actually took me to see The Crow at the drive-in when it came out. And I had uh, written down here that it came out in the spring of 1994. So, yeah, I was still when I was still doing going to the movies with my parents. <laughs> You know, right. It was a little bit not that it I mean, I could totally respect that people liked it, but I was a little bit bored or disinterested with regular comic book stuff. But when people put something in front of me where somebody was a little bit more experimenting with the medium or the shorter run stories that weren't didn't require a massive commitment, I was in. Yeah, because that was, I mean, that was hard to do. It was almost impossible living in a small town where you didn't have like a super dedicated comic shop and the disposable income to keep buying the books in a series. Like collecting a whole run of just about anything was basically impossible as far as like my my childhood comic buying would go. So yeah, I definitely have be better memories of the, the one-shot stuff. That I, I definitely, I still have an issue somewhere around here of... Uh, Batman the Dark Knight, where Batman goes to a small Louisiana town and is like trying to solve a murder, and he kind of has to team up briefly with Swamp Thing, I think. Which, yeah, that's that's the uh, I, I still have that and like a handful of other comics that I bought, like when I was very, very young laying around here. And yeah, I remember that one, and that one is that that issue is still like one of my favorites because the art style in it is so spooky and like it's it's drawn like a horror movie basically and reading that when i was like i don't know seven eight nine ten somewhere around in there like i i definitely didn't get a, a lot of the nuances about the story but definitely the art style i feel like kind of grabbed me um so yeah it's it's an interesting interesting time in comics when all this stuff is coming out and i, I feel like it kind of comes and goes in waves because yeah around the early 2000s and then again kind of around the 2010s uh this stuff starts happening i think the early uh about mid 2000s is kind of when i started reading the walking dead which i feel like is another like that's uh i forget which comic label that is i, I used to have a whole complete run of those but uh another one where it's kind of back to basics it's a it's another black and white uh drawn you know by one one or two dudes uh fairly violent kind of not really like a traditional comic book you know it's it's, it's not a cape book at all basically and uh i don't feel yeah the, the crow is also kind of like that um i think walking dead was also image comics yeah you might be right actually i, I, I do believe so i used to have a bunch of those later on. i don't know where the hell they all went but uh so yeah, uh, so if it took if it took that long for James Abar to write The Crow, I think it's pretty safe to assume that he probably started on this like er, like late eighties. Uh, like you said, the the character of Eric Draven, our, our protagonist, is kind of based on uh, Iggy Pop, and there there are lots of uh, I, I I think his face kind of is modeled after the guy from Bauhaus. Uh, and the makeup is the in the documentary that I was watching. It's the, they say that it's based on uh, the 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 mask for like irony, like the um, you know what I'm talking about. Is that like Greek, where you have like the the, the theater masks basically? And I knew, I knew about the two, like you know, uh, comedy and tragedy. And irony, I think, is basically the one that's kind of in between. But yeah, it's very similar. Uh, the other thing, what I was surprised I didn't bring up was uh, the guy from The Killing Joke. Uh, 
which is a band that I'm sort of familiar with. I've, I'm not a huge Killing Joke fan, but I definitely recognize. Uh, I, I would assume probably the Killing Joke dudes' makeup came before the Crow, and because uh, the, the the Crow the original Crow books are also littered with uh, like song quotes and lyrics. Like there's some Joy Division that pops up in there, and the Cure. And uh, it was it was also a really interesting time in music when this thing came out. Uh, the comic, I think, yeah, the I, I would imagine James Abar was big into like the death rock scene, you know, stuff like Joy Division and The Cure and Killing Joke and Bauhaus, and it's just kind of like downbeat, gothic kind of like uh, minimalist guitar kind of music is how I would describe death rock if you're not really familiar. Um, it's, it's sometimes I think it kind of can be referred to as post punk too. It's, it's just the the kind of the end of uh, you know punk music had got gone through gone through quite a few phases at this point. Like we'd had our early you know garage inspired stuff, and you know there, there's a little bit of thrash inspiration in there, and the new wave, uh, and then eventually somewhere along the line they settled on death rock. I think towards the late eight, end end of the '80s, basically. Um, so which I think is kind of cool and unique. I, I can't really think of a lot of other comics that incorporate music like that kind of I, I think watchmen does a little bit of that um but uh, typically it's the the two mediums don't really meld all that well together so i can only assume that probably comic artists tend to avoid that stuff but james apart kind of embraced it and, uh there's just like, I, I think it just adds to the overall you know the overall tone and aesthetic of the books basically when it plants the seed of like this music and uh when, by the time the movie came out just somebody I, I mentioned on my facebook earlier that we were recording a show about the crow and somebody was like the crow soundtrack uh is on heavy heavy rotation in my house uh obviously that soundtrack pulls from stuff that's like a little bit later than what i think james abar was kind of referencing in the books and it's more of the post grunge type era like i think at this point nirvana had kind of come and gone and uh just a lot of interesting shit going on in music at this point like definitely the nine inch nails needle drop that comes like towards the middle of the movie i was like oh okay this, this puts me in a, <laughs> a mind frame and a place like like when all this this stuff was coming out uh, again, I, I was pretty young when the book and the movie of this came out. So uh, a lot of this I've gotten later in life. I wasn't really so much aware of any of this. I think at that age, really, um, uh, definitely one thing that everybody I think was aware of by the time the Crow movie came out was uh, what ended up happening to Brandon Lee, which. Uh, I feel like was never really properly explained to me like what actually happened until a year or two ago when Shudder put out a series called Cursed Films. Did you did you end up watching that or have you seen that episode about the crow on that at any point? I didn't watch that, but I did look into it a little bit and see a couple, you know, the curse of Brandon Lee fucking documentaries that everybody made around that time where they basically went through and uh did you watch the did you rewatch the cursed films one i, I, I did i take, I, the, take the lead on telling the the story of the the tragedy and if i have any uh additional information i can interject by the way he specifically obar specifically mentions joy division as being a big influence when he was writing and drawing the comic as well as Jim Carroll. Okay. I, I mean, that makes perfect sense. That's all uh, fairly morose downbeat kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. it fits the, it fits the mood of the book like perfectly, which yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense why he, why he put that stuff in there. I think it just adds to the mood, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff that pops up in that episode of Cursed Films, I, I think you, you can get from other other sources like Wikipedia and stuff. But um, yeah, basically, so in a nutshell, kind of the, the reason there's really only like two actual things that I can really point to why people would think that it was like a cursed production, because this is another thing that comes up every 
uh, 10 or 15 years, like the, you know, the, 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 the other movies that they did episodes on were like the exorcist poltergeist, uh, the twilight zone movie. And I think the omen was another one where just like weird shit happens, like you know, happens on set and, you know, people get hurt and, you know, the, I, I feel it's, it, I feel like it's kind of a lazy way out of just attributing that all to it's it's a cursed production or there there's something evil surrounding the production. I really uh, like not so much in the case of the crow, but like those other movies, a lot of it was because there were fucking egomaniacs in charge of these productions and people that had no uh, consideration for people's safety or, you know, because studios cutting corners and stuff. That kind of, I think, is what led to a lot of the bad things that happened on these productions. And it's kind of hard to say, like, there's there's some discussion on The Crow as far as that goes. Uh, so basically, kind of what happened, for, first day they're filming, uh, they had an accident. They're, they're on, I forget which back lot. It might be the Warner Brothers back lot or some. Uh, uh, for people that don't know, a back lot is uh, basically just like a. It's you you see it a lot used as exteriors, and it's usually like they're basically just fronts of buildings that have been built to look like a city street, but it is in fact like you know it's it's the back lot. It's 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 behind where the giant indoor studios on. Uh, you know, a studio property is. So they, they build these like fake streets, basically. Uh, apparently, there were a couple of electricians working on this movie that got into their truck that had like, you know, like a cherry picker boom arm on the back of it. Uh, I'm not super clear as to why, but apparently one of the dudes was driving the truck and one of the dudes was in the cherry picker and they backed into a high voltage power line that was powering the entire back lot, like lights, you know, everything that required electricity, they backed into it. This dude gets like absolutely fried in the cherry picker because the electricity just goes right through the boom arm up into where he's standing. His body is covered in second and third degree burns. And he, you know, loses some of his face, face, facial features that have basically been burnt off. This is fucking day one of the shoot and the shit happens uh, a little bit. Late. Yeah, it's it's a bad tone. That's not how you want to start your fucking movie production. Uh, they were also blasted by I guess, I guess some of this wasn't filmed on like a studio backlog. They must have like rented out a space or something somewhere. It was in the eye of whatever the hell hurricane there was that year. This was before Katrina. I can't remember offhand which hurricane this is but uh a whole bunch of their sets got destroyed in this like you know unprecedented storm that came about it like just a horrible fucking hurricane that just destroyed a bunch of their sets and set the back and you know made the budget for this thing balloon quite a bit um and that's when some of these stories kind of started getting leaked to like some of the entertainment like magazines and shit like entertainment weekly and variety and stuff we're running stories about, oh, this is a troubled production. And at some point, somebody coined the term the curse of the crow. Uh, and this, this was before what happened to Brandon Lee, which is uh, like everybody knew about this like when we were kids, which is basically they were filming a shot, which I don't think actually like you can't you can't like scrub through the movie and be like, this is the exact shot where Brandon got fucking um so basically what yeah, they, happened they destroyed it after the investigation right and the scene still i mean the the, the actual shot that he <sighs> so basically what happens um there's a couple different ways that you can use blanks in a movie like for gun type stuff and this obviously uh I, they haven't really come out and said yet but i'm pretty sure this is what exactly happened with fucking alec baldwin here pretty recently on the filming of that western rust where uh, a cinematographer was killed and a director was shot um there's two different ways you can kind of do it you can take like if you need a shot where as big on westerns and stuff where you see them loading the bullets into the chamber of like a revolver or whatever uh you can make what's known as a dummy round where it's basically a live bullet 
but it's had the gunpowder taking taken out and like uh so it's it's just like the the shell and the lead tip of the bullet basically um what they're pretty sure happened on the crow is that they used one of those like a few weeks maybe prior to shooting the scene with brandon and they there there's like a firing i forget what it's called i'm not super huge in a gun so if i get my terminology wrong here i apologize but uh basically um they shot like a dummy round which if it's got no powder in it i mean it doesn't it's not going to really do anything really all it did was like strike the uh like firing pin i guess in in the end of the the cartridge and the lead the lead bullet like the actual bullet hollow point uh came out of the shell and is stuck in the barrel of this fucking revolver it's like a 357 magnum or something like big big mean fucking gun uh so nobody checks this gun uh there's there's speculation that at this point in the shoot they they were only about five days away from being completed with principal photography on this i think they said it was like a 57 day shoot or something and this was uh day like 52 somewhere around in there um there's for sure there's there, there's speculation that the union uh arms handlers who were you know held to a very high standard uh there there's a reason that this doesn't happen very often on movies at least on union shoots uh there's speculation that that guy got sent home like as towards the end of the uh the shoot and they were legally allowed to bring in like a local guy uh to to fill in for him and they're pretty sure what happened is no nobody ever checked the barrel of this prop the quote-unquote prop gun which is very much a fucking real gun uh the it's the ammunition that's the prop and the you know part that makes it not real uh nobody ever checked this gun for like uh something stuck in the barrel they go to shoot a film or they go to film a shot which they kind of changed on the day like originally i think he's supposed to get like a knife thrown at him and they had you know the makeup and prosthetics all all the stuff set up for this and like on the day they decided they're like no let's make it so that he gets shot basically i I guess they figured maybe they could have that film a little bit quicker or whatever and uh yeah basically they, they go to do the shot and the gun goes off you know there's powder and smoke it's it's they've loaded the right kind of cartridge into the gun that doesn't have an actual bullet it's just you know gunpowder so you get the, the smoke and the, the the visual aspect of it and uh they point the gun right at fucking brandon lee and pull the trigger and he hits the dirt and uh yeah they they do a little demonstration in that episode of um cursed films and it's maybe not as gnarly as being shot like full force with like an actual bullet, but like they they do like a demonstration and it goes through like fucking two to six inches of fucking plywood like it's nothing. So you can imagine what that would be like if that was your fucking torso. So um, so Brandon Lee ended up dying. Uh, it's super fucking sad for a lot of reasons. Uh, this was definitely supposed to be the movie where Brandon Lee, uh, kind of, this, this was going to be his big break. He'd made a few movies before this that were mostly martial arts movies and action movies, but none of them were like humongous successes. And this was kind of going to be his, you know, big break. This is going to be the movie that made him a huge star. And, uh, that obviously, didn't didn't end up happening which is super fucking sad there's also a really weird uh thing on the last bruce lee movie bruce lee obviously you know being his his father uh i can't remember what the name of the movie is but there's totally a fucking scene where the exact same thing happens and it's like i mean it's 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 like scripted into the movie like it's it's part of the character or whatever he plays a a martial artist and it's like a movie within a movie kind of deal where yeah he he gets murdered on camera because a guy switches a fake bullet out of a fucking quote-unquote prop gun which is super spooky i believe so (laughs) that sounds right which is super duper spooky uh bruce lee obviously died under really weird conditions too he had his and this totally sounds fucking fake, but evidently it's it's a real thing. He'd had his sweat glands removed so he could look better 
on screen and at some point uh was hanging out with some chick that they're fairly certain he was having a f- having an affair with and he took a painkiller and he fucking died from it and like not not too like i don't know why there were no doctors in bruce lee's life they were like maybe this is like taking out your sweat glands thing is a bad idea bud because he ended up having like a seizure on the filming of that last movie and uh like yeah, they, they're pretty sure that kind of contributed to it. He he, he, he took. The, they think also that like this painkiller that he took, he might have just had like a horrendous allergic reaction to. Like they just didn't know that that was obviously it wasn't something prescribed to him, so they had no way of knowing how he would react to it or whatever. And uh, I mean, it's it's a bummer, but it's there's nothing you know spooky or cursed about how Bruce Lee died. But um, I got I got a sip of sip of tea here. Go oh, ahead. Okay, there I had not heard about the sweat glands thing. I don't think, and if I did, I think I put it in with you know, oh, he got his ribs removed so he could suck his own dick. I, well, I, yeah. But I did see in a documentary that he was hanging out with his almost definitely mistress, and he took he took a painkiller drug that was given to him by. A friend and they said that it was a extreme allergic reaction uh, so there's enough connecting information there that uh yeah and i know that people said that well you know he and brandon were both killed because bruce lee wouldn't pay the triads for you know it's like no that's that's a fantastic story but Usually, yeah, especially with, uh, I mean, workplace accidents due to neglect, exhaustion, and incompetence are much more common and much more likely. And especially on night shoots, you hear a lot of weird shit that happens with night shoots. Like they they also kind of attribute that that to like kind of how Heath Ledger died I think because he was like working really weird hours and taking you know different kinds of prescriptions and like I, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that like humans are not meant to work overnights for like fucking long long stretches of time and that is when accidents and weird shit kind of happens it's not and uh, there's nothing yeah there's absolutely nothing supernatural about it it can all just be contributed to you know people get exhausted and fuck up things and accidents happen kind of deal you know yeah overworked people in the movie industry oh if the people at paramount weren't making sure everything was up to snuff because that that was who had it first like paramount and then after uh brandon lee died miramax took over Right. And got the movie finished ma- being made. And um, what's his name? Uh, who played Fun Boy was the guy that shot him. And right. He quit acting for a year or two. And I don't know. I think the next thing we should probably transition to is to talk about the cast in a, in a larger sense. Because what a cast. I remember it being huge that it happened and yes, bringing up Heath Ledger and movies that were going to make you make the person that next jump up. And uh, yeah, because I don't think I had heard of Brandon Lee before The Crow came out. Now, I wasn't a big action movie guy. I'm sure I I watched, you know, Commando and Terminator and Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. And, you know, maybe a couple other things, Bruce Lee, but I definitely wasn't seeing the type of action movies that Brandon Lee was working in that, you know, you would see on Cinemax after the porn ended or before the porn. Yeah, he really hadn't made much. Like, I still don't think I've seen any of these other movies that Brandon Lee has been in, and I don't really... Like I've never really heard anybody be like, you should definitely check out this one or like this is his other like really great movie. Like I don't think uh, it was pre- it was a, a very fortunate thing for him. I, I'm sure at the time like that he was uh, he was attached to play at the star in like a very buzzed about comic book adaption, which like that 
it, that even that right there, like had a completely different meaning in 1993 when they started making this than it does like now. Like I don't, I don't think it was. I think it was fairly unheard of that comic books were getting made into movies. They were they were very few and far between. So like this was really meant to be a big fucking deal to Brandon Lee, and he kind of got robbed of that. Yeah, people like Tim Burton made comic book movies at that time, and that was part of his deals with studios to make other movies that would make them money. Uh, I, de- I, I'm sure I saw showdown in little Tokyo, but that was because of Dolph Lundgren. Oh, okay. And yeah, uh, the, the crow, when they weren't on the back lot and stuff, they were shooting in Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay. So that, right that was, in hurricane alley. Yeah. I, I remember, that added to the tragedy. I mean, it's just all these layers of tragedy folded upon each other that make the crow. There's James O'Barr's tragedy that the story bait that the story is based on and the lost love and random sudden death. And then yeah, multiple accidents and, things on set and and then Brandon Lee's accidental death and then I mean the movie did well when it came out but it just it became this this thing in culture you know like every goth girl I knew in high school loved the fucking crow all the guys that I was just like man this guy's so sad why is this guy always so sad <laughs> that guy liked the crow and you know i i didn't dislike it but i didn't latch on to it at that age you know when i was becoming a teen and stuff i i was just like okay yeah there's there's the crow but i was also that guy I was like too many people like this and they're all sad I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sad. I'm not going to give a shit about this movie. Yeah, you know, I didn't shit on it or anything like I did with other things, you know, trying to or not trying to, but you know. <laughs> the goth the goth kids loved it. I think I think we were more a little more into like the punk rock stuff and kind of s- skipped over, you know, stuff like this and like uh, the, the other one is the, the Sandman comics by Neil Gaiman. Uh, those oh, are right fucking huge with the goth kids they all worship that shit and yeah it kind of passed me over too as like a teenager and whatnot like i mean everybody i think was familiar with the the circumstances around the movie but like any any of the like source material and stuff i think uh could completely pass by the majority of people but uh i I've, yeah I've, i feel like i finally reached the age now where i kind of have an appreciation for how incredibly morbid and sad these fucking books and these movies are um i don't know why that is exactly <laughs> i guess i'm just a little more a little more in touch with my emotions at the age of 35 than <laughs> i would have been at like 17 or whatever but yeah. this movie isn't exactly about me that sort of thing you get beyond uh, that where it's like i don't completely identify with the protagonist now i of course also that's a bit of a shallow look because I think when you get older or you appreciate more levels of movies and art and stuff, there is an easy relatability with the characters. There's, I mean, everybody, pretty much everybody is loved and lost. Yep. Uh, There's also when you, something that I totally missed, like this whole thing is like a landlord terrorizing tenants so that they can take over a neighborhood gentrify or uh, anti-tenants rights shit. Like that's what this whole thing was, was because Shelly was organizing uh, tenants in a building and uh, what's this fight? Top dollar in this, in the comic book, from my understanding, top dollar and uh, Tintin and all the other people are all kind of like on the same level. But since this is a movie, there has to be the final boss. So they right. kind of added on. So there's, let's see, the characters. There's uh, Fun Boy and T Bird, who might even be more of a main guy in the comic. Tintin, 
played by the guy that played Lord Nikon and Hackers. Uh, who else? There's uh, in the comic there was Tom Tom, but he was kind of rolled into that skank character that uh, the, that that hangs out with T Bird and seems like he's had a couple head injuries. Oh right. And Top Dollar, who was played by Michael Wincott, who was the sheriff of Nottingham's cousin in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. He's, I, I uh, fucking loved that movie as a kid. And he is like such an incredible fucking villain. And in, in both of these movies, like that dude just exudes like this, like greasy kind of fucking, I don't know. He's, he, he is a great goddamn bad guy. Yeah. I mean, Alien resurrection. I remember he was in strange days, but it's been so fucking long since I've seen that. Um, yeah, great fucking villain with his witch girlfriend sister. Uh huh. I'd kind of forgotten that it's implied that they're brother and sister, which is also super gross and weird. And they like fucked a woman to death or something when uh, T Bird is waiting and chit chatting with Candyman henchmen. The but the fucking cast man. You know, there's you know Brandon Lee. Ernie Hudson as Sergeant Albrecht, who's pretty much straight out of the comic. Michael Wincott as Top Dollar. Bai Ling was the witchy girlfriend sister. David Patrick Kelly, Michael Massey, Tony Todd, what was his name? Grange, but he was the the henchman. I, I really like Ernie Hudson in this. He plays an incredibly likable character in this. He's like... Uh, a cop that's not a piece of shit. In fact, like he he gets demoted from like a detective to a to a beat cop because he's doing his job too well, which I think is kind of a hilarious <laughs> commentary on the the cops in this movie, which are not they're like they're, they're really the cops don't play a whole lot into this except for Ernie Hudson. He's kind of our uh, our everyman, you know, kind of explains what the fuck is going on to the audience kind of character, which is sort of needed like i mean I, I bet in the comics they probably used him a lot less because uh, you get like a lot of monologue between eric draven and like the crow that follows him around that only he can like talk to basically i i would imagine a lot more of the story and plot probably goes between those two where that doesn't that's not really the crow doesn't fucking talk in the movie because that would be super silly <laughs> and i think just a, a step too far for just general audience kind of stuff. So that that's kind of where Ernie Hudson's character comes in as he does some investigating and finds out that, yeah, about, you know, um, about she- Shelly's stuff with, you know, being an anti uh, eviction advocate, basically. And that Eric Draven was like a rock star, like up and coming kind of, um, which doesn't really play into the, I think that's the other things different from the comics and the movies. Is I don't think he's a, like a rock and roll star in the, in the books, but he is in the movies. I think that's a purely uh, like it looks cool kind of thing. Cause we get, get the shot of him playing his fucking jet black guitar on top of the building. And it's super Gothic and moody. And I'm sure it makes all the goth girls in the crowd swoon. Uh, but yeah, that's his amp later on in the, in the <laughs> second rooftop solo. Yep. But uh, yeah, yeah, er- Ernie Hudson's great in this. I, I think this is like one of the he he plays like side characters and like you know, uh, I think he got kind of typecast with Ghostbusters, where he he's he kind of plays a token black guy in a lot of movies. Whereas in The Crow, he uh, like he 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 is the, he is the audience's eyes in this movie basically, and he he actually like gets a fair amount of stuff to do. He has like kind of a relationship with the girl the little girl sarah that uh eric and shelly kind of you know help out and take care of and are kind of friends with i don't know she's like a dirtbag drug addict for a mom and uh so those two get kind of a get kind of a character arc uh this movie made me really hungry for hot dogs for some fucking reason there's those those street dogs that ernie hudson's fucking buying at the onions on it like i I went to the grocery store today i was like i'm gonna buy hot dogs this movie makes me want makes me want a good good old good old-fashioned street dog Um, style hot dogs yeah lots of onions um yeah uh tony todd's another one he gets to play kind of a like 
he's another one that I think gets kind of typecast as like, you know, he plays a lot of bad guys. I don't know where this took, where this came out in relation. I think Candyman was like within, that was, had to have been like 94, 95 or something. So uh, Tony Todd's also about to become a really big deal once Candyman comes out. And I think that kind of affects the trajectory of his acting career quite a bit. Whereas in this, he basically gets to play like the main bad guy's kind of right hand. And he's kind of one of the only competent ones of these guys. He gets the cool gun. He dresses like cool, like he's he's in a suit, like he's he's the distinguished scumbag of this, like basically gang of fucking terrible people that uh, Eric has come back from the dead to kill. Um, but I, they should have known like right then and there that Tony Todd was going to be a big deal. I mean, that dude's voice is just his voice alone is like so fucking iconic. But uh, this is also kind of a great example of the like. He, he's really kind of a chameleon of an actor. That dude can just like slip in and out of parts, like it's may and make it look just completely effortless. Um, but uh, he's he's yeah, so he's he's probably one of my favorite bad guys. I didn't really enjoy the parts where uh, T Bird and the like the other guys have their like <laughs> they're like they're they're just having so much fun doing these fucking crimes and they have their. The, their little catchphrase that they do. What is it? They're like, fire it up. <laughs> oh, just, yeah. That's... When they're running around that acting like the gang from Robocop. Yeah. Like, they're, they're definitely super chewing the scenery, but they're, they're a lot of fun to watch. They kind of kind of cracked me up and almost made me not want them to die horribly. But in the, they, they keep flashing back to the, uh, the, the murder and implied rape scenes like just enough that you're like oh yeah these guys are pieces of shit and you're just like get them so this came out two years after Candyman came out oh okay that's weird but i mean 93 was when brandon lee died so it was almost basically a year they were working on it about a year after Candyman came out okay and i feel like Candyman got a bit more popular once it came out on tape. Not that it did poorly, but uh, yeah, so this was uh, the, and the movie before this, Tony Todd was in oh, fuck, I can't remember the name, but it was like an action type movie. So yeah, this was the second movie in a year and a half basically after Candyman came out. So Tony Todd doing what Tony Todd does and here, let me he had two movies come out in 86 Three came out in 87, two came out in 88, then 89, 90, two movies came out in 90, two movies came out in 92, one of them being Candyman, then 93, 94, 95, 95, 96, 96, 96, 97, 97, 97, 98, 98, 98. All right. (laughs) The man stays busy. He has done an absolute (laughs) ass load of movies over the years. Yeah, uh, you know, fi- Final Destination was 2000 or 2001. Um, shit on me, as the pawn shop owner would say, for some weird reason. I don't know if that's from the comic. I think that's another thing about the movie is there are some parts that, I don't know, uh, I don't know if you would say they didn't age well, but there's some parts that definitely look like a comic book movie. You know, there's parts where the scenery all looks like it's painted on. That so that it could be some things that people would say is a, a flaw of the movie, but I think it makes it more comic booky. You know how over the top ridiculous top dollar is, right? And shit like that. Well, I mean, even like the uh, like the set design and stuff. It's it's definitely I'm sure super duper inspired by like uh, I mean the super obvious one that I, that my mind jumps to is Tim Burton's Batman movie, which was all you know. Like they basically just like picked and cho- chose a lot of stuff from fifty years worth of people drawing Gotham City and kind of what that looks like, and uh, it definitely, it, it, I'm sure it definitely evolved like over the years where you know sometimes it looks a lot more dystopian than it normally would. And I de- '90s comics, I definitely feel like leaned really hard into. Uh, ur- urban decay and just the uh, you know the shitty concrete jungle that's just full of you know piss and fucking drug addicts and hookers and 
uh, the, the Sin City books, I think, played a lot into that, too. And just, just in general, like I think Frank Miller loved to love to play around with that stuff where, you know, it's, it's super cliche, but the, the city becomes a character in itself. Oh, well, this doesn't, you know, take place in Gotham City, but it definitely I think feel, I feel like borrows from just the scuzzy city look of uh, the the way cities were drawn in, in comics at the time. And the, the, the it, they they did try really hard, I think, on a fairly small budget to translate that to the movie when the movie came out. But yeah, where my mind immediately goes is the Tim Burton Batman movie. Because it's just like it, it looks like it never stops raining. Uh, it's everything is just like has just like a sheen of grease over it. It feels like, um, they and said they took like, a lot of the color out on purpose. Yeah, which uh, helps. You know, that that's kind of a fairly traditional kind of you know, not even really just an art like a film trick, but like an art trick is yeah, you you, you dull the colors for. Uh, everything except for what you want there to be emphasis of color on. Like, I mean, the, yeah, so Sin City is a great example of that, where the majority of the books are, you know, just straight up black and white, but uh, there would be these little little Schindler's List-esque flares of color, like, hidden in there for emphasis, kind of. Uh, obviously, they couldn't do The Crow, like, even, even back then, like, trying to do The Crow movie in black and white, probably would have been box office suicide and people would have walked out of him like i didn't pay fucking four dollars or whatever a ticket cost back then to watch a black and white movie so they had to do it in color so yeah kind of the way you do that is you, your, your sets are uh very minimally lit and colored basically which i think is cool it's it, like we were saying earlier it's it's kind of of the time but I also feel like this movie came out quite a bit before a lot of movies that like tried to do way the same exact thing. Like it's not really a name for the kind of subgenre that this inspired, like, you know, movies like the matrix and, uh, slay, like a lot of like action movies. I feel like borrowed from this in, in like the story and like i mean this this is around the same time like tarantino's starting to do some fairly violent subversive movies and like uh it, it was a weird time for comics and movies kind of like the early 90s like a lot of the you know people that like we consider like pioneers of like film now kind of were starting to get their start in the early 90s and we're making some pretty experimental wild shit and uh, the Crow, like even though it is a you know ostensibly a studio movie, I, I think is super duper ahead of its time in that respect, in in look and tone and feel kind of. So uh, one 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 thing I took away from the, the this watch because I've I've seen this a few times. I didn't see this until quite a bit later in life, like my you know early twenties. I would say um, I kept doing this thing where. I knew, uh, so we should probably explain what a fake Shemp is. Uh, that's a term that was kind of coined by uh, Sam Raimi when they were filming the original Evil Dead movies. And kind of where that comes from is the original Three Stooges uh, shorts that came out in like the 40s and 50s or whatnot. There was actually a fourth Stooge that died and was replaced with, I think, Curly. And they used to film those Three Stooges, you know, shorts, uh, like three or four of them at a time. Like basically, I think whenever they could borrow uh, sets and, you know, stuff like that from from other productions and, then you know, get the Stooges on there and film or whatever. So they had a whole shitload of shorts that were not finished when this guy i forget what his first name is but his last name is shemp he's kind of a weird looking guy and he's like the older he like he, he's considerably older i think than the other two stooges at the time that these were filming uh so he dies like in in the middle of filming a whole bunch of these and like they couldn't just abandon you know these these shorts that they've shot the majority of uh, so what they would do is they would try and find uh, basically a body double or somebody that looks enough like him, at least from like the back or the sides that, that they could squeeze him into the shot. So that there's, you know, three of them there. He wouldn't have any dialogue or whatever, but uh, 
yeah, Sam Raimi kind of, you know, had enough of a keen eye as a young filmmaker and a huge Stooge fan that they would play a leg. Basically, they made like a game out of it where you would spot the fake Shemp. Uh, so that kind of became the term for uh, on when, when they filmed, filmed the first Evil Dead movie and they started losing cast members because it went way over schedule. And people were just like, fuck this. I've had enough. I'm leaving. But their characters, you know, still had it still had to shoot stuff with those characters. So they would do basically the same thing where they dress somebody up and put like a bad fucking wig on them and shoot them from, from the back. Um, there is a little bit of fake jumping going on in the crow. And I'm fairly certain that like most of that comes in like the first, like 10 or 15 minutes of this movie. And the, the majority of the rest of this, I think they had in the can by the time the accident happened with Brandon Lee, but uh, you can always tell. And like, I mean, this happens on movies where the, your, your actor is still alive. Like there, there's absolutely nothing like this is a, this is a fairly common practice, mostly because I, I think a lot of it's to save money because it's a lot cheaper and easier to get, you know, like say Chris Evans body double on set for a day than it is to get actual Chris Evans. Like if you don't have, if you don't absolutely have to have your star on, like, I mean, it's always kind of a shortcut and something that I don't think like probably a lot of people even notice kind of. Um, but yeah, I definitely could tell there's a lot of shots at the beginning of the crow that are filmed either like from behind Eric Draven's character, or it might just be like his feet or something. Or like if you go back and watch it, like, yeah, you can kind of make a game out of it. of just like spotting all the shots that are probably not him or probably his body double. Um, there's apparently also like, I didn't know this either until I watched that episode of cursed films, but uh, they did need a few shots of Eric Draven in the crow makeup, like from the front. So they got his body double who like, he looks fairly like the dude, like except for in his face, basically they apparently made a fucking mask of Brandon Lee and made this dude wear it for a couple shots. And they said that it freaked everybody out big time on, on set and that they really didn't want to do it. But I, I think there was, you know, maybe a couple of shots that kind of where they need, like, if you stuck him in the background, you probably, like I said, you probably wouldn't know that that's not him. Or if, you know, the focus is a little soft on him, like you probably wouldn't be able to tell, but yeah, this the, the makeup effects guy said that that was like one of the hardest things he ever had to do. And that it was really fucking creepy on set. Like, cause they, they all, they all loved Brandon. Like they, they, he was, he was, you know, he, he was, he was a really cool guy. And yeah, it, it hadn't been, I don't think a lot of time passed between the accident and when uh, basically his family and stuff with Brandon Lee's family was like, you should finish this movie. Like he would have wanted people to have seen this. And this was, you know, something he was really excited to do and he, you need to fucking finish the movie. Uh, so they, you know, they did the best they could. I, they, uh, they, they rewrote some parts. Uh, Michael Berryman was a, apparently supposed to be in this movie he was going to play a character that is in the comics like called the skull cowboy it was another kind of like omnipotent like being that pops up to kind of i think move the story of the comics along a little bit more and kind of tells like eric draven like what's going on like he's 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 not like the angel of death but kind of along those lines basically and he's just like a rotted away skeleton looking dude that's like a cowboy basically uh, and Michael Berryman was supposed to play him in the movie and they shot like a couple shots towards the beginning of production. I think mostly to figure out like the, uh, cause it was a fairly complicated, like prosthetic suit that Michael Berryman was wearing, which is kind of a travesty in itself. Cause that dude is so fucking interesting. Why would you want to cover him up with a bunch of prosthetics? Like those, you know, get a skinny stunt guy my michael berryman i think is a little bit too fucking good for that but uh anyway they uh they had to cut like pretty much all of that shit that they had originally scripted with the 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 skull cowboy because i think almost all of it was uh him speaking directly to eric draven's character which i, I they were smart enough to not 
try anything that was going to involve like any dialogue that they obviously didn't have recorded or anything like they had to they had to move some stuff around and re rewrite some stuff and sadly the, the skull cowboy was i think one of the first things that got the axe because they hadn't got around to filming the rest of it until the towards the end of production but uh yeah my michael berryman is such a fucking man that dude is so fucking rad i, I met him in denver if film festival at some point and that's kind of a bummer that he's not in the movie i think it could have been pretty rad um i mean he, he's he would have been basically unrecognizable under all that makeup and i'm sure they would have dubbed his voice something a little spookier but uh really cool dude and yeah it's the stuff he had to say about this production i think is almost like makes it worth checking out that episode of cursed films really, really interesting dude kind of a bummer yeah his whole whole entire character got the axe after uh the accident so um yeah really really weird movie to rewatch all these years later no knowing all of this right i think we should take a quick break and then when we come back you can tell me about watching the sequel and we'll oh, talk yeah. about whatever else that comes up and then i'll let you go rest your voice how's that all sound okay sounds good yeah i'm gonna go make a cup of tea real quick all right Hello? Hello. Who is this? Who are you trying to reach? I don't know. Um, I think you've got the wrong number. Do I? I'm going to hang up. Wait, don't hang up. What's that noise? Popcorn? You're making popcorn. Uh huh. I only eat popcorn when I listen to podcasts. I'm about to listen to a podcast. Oh, really? Which one? Probably the podcast on Haunted Hill. Is that the one with the two guys with the beards? Uh, yeah, Dan and Gav. Most episodes, they look at two different horror movies. Each episode, they look at a world of the strange, where they look at weird things from around the world. Sometimes, they even do special episodes where they look at different genres or directors' discographies and talk about them. Do you have a boyfriend? Maybe. So where can I find the podcast on Haunted Hill? Well, you can go to legionpodcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, or just go into iTunes and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. So, are you going to ask me out? Um... Are we back or are we not back? I don't know. Are we? <laughs> yes, we are. And you're going to tell me about the Crow City of Angels. Maybe. So... Or maybe just a little bit. And then we'll uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody and all that fun wrapping up stuff. So the Crow City of Angels is the first of three fucking sequels uh, in movie form. There was also a TV series of The Crow, which I completely fucking forgot about. I think it aired on Fox in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the Crow City of Angels was the first one, uh, also put out by Miramax. I think a lot of the same producers that worked on the first movie worked on this one. Uh, came out in 1996, so only about three years after the original Crow movie comes out. Uh, Brandon Lee has been replaced by an actor named Vincent Perez, um, who has mostly done a lot of Spanish language stuff that I have never heard of. He also directed a few features here fairly recently. Um, he, uh, he has a very, very difficult uh, job of, you know, replacing like one of the probably most widely publicized like uh uh you know film accidents in fucking history with the exception of maybe like the twilight zone movie which has an awful horrible fucking sad story about it um so i i had never seen this i remember it coming out i don't remember if this played in theaters at all uh there there is a box office gross listed on wikipedia this made 25 million dollars apparently which is weird to think about because it's definitely this movie looks like it cost more than 25 million dollars i mean it doesn't have nearly as many uh <clears throat> like big stars as the first movie does but um it get yeah, the the production value carries over like i mean they, they, it's there's there's not a huge drop in quality of like what you're seeing on the screen as far as like sets and special effects goes like it's a pretty pretty heavy movie in, in terms of that i and yeah like i said i remember i remember this came out 
uh, we had satellite at my house, so DirecTV was like advertising the shit out of this and one wanting you to watch it on whatever their equivalent of pay-per-view at the time was. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure I distinctly remember asking my mom about this. And I was like, didn't the guy that played the crow die? How, how the hell did they make another movie of, about this? And that's, I'm sure she was like, well, I'm sure they got a you know new new person to play him, basically. Um, I didn't, I, I sat and watched this a couple days ago cause you can watch the first two if you're a Paramount plus subscriber right now. Um, there, 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 like I said, there is two other sequels, one of which is on no fucking streaming service, which is the third one, the crow salvation. I, I was going to sit and watch all of these while I was on quarantine these last two weeks, but the crow salvation is almost impossible to find. And the fourth one, uh, The Crow, Wicked Prayer, which came out in 2005 on that last one. Salvation came out in 2000. Uh, Edward Furlong plays our main character, The Crow. And I watched a few trailers for that fourth one. And it just looks like the fucking cheapest piece of shit movie <laughs> I've ever like I I don't I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to pay four dollars to rent that thing because it looks like a fucking Tommy Wiseau movie like phenomenally like low quality and low budget. The Crow City of Angels isn't bad. Uh, it's basically kind of it's it's similar to the comics in the respect that it's basically the same thing over again, just with different characters. Like I think they could have kept like I mean they kept making Crow comics after the movie came out. Like you're like like I said, Dark Horse I think published quite a few, and then IDW publishing like picked up the rights and did quite a few of them in the 2010s. Uh, and quite a few of them are really good, but they all kind of follow the same story. Like they're all kind of like somebody dies and is brought back by the crow and kind of embodies the character for one reason or another. Uh, Vincent Perez plays, plays the main character in this. His name is Ash. Uh, he's like a, like a car mechanic or something and he doesn't really have like a, a lady in his life uh but he he does have a son his, his the the son's mother apparently fucked off at some point before the movie because she was a drug addict there there's lots of anti-drug messaging in this movie like almost all of our main characters are like drug dealers and junkies and lots of stuff uh, Sarah, the, the little girl from the first movie is now a grown up character. Uh, she's played by Mia Kirshner, who, uh, she's probably the best part of this movie. She's got incredible screen presence and this is gorgeous. And, uh, she plays kind of a, she, she, she plays a little girl grown up. So she's familiar with Eric Draven and Shelly and all that and kind of knows, what's going on like as far as uh she's in this one she's kind of the audience's eyes and kind of explains to ash like what's going on and that he's you know come back from the dead for a pretty specific reason mostly revenge um and so it's kind of the base is basically kind of the same thing it's a, it's a revenge story um iggy pop is actually in this fucking movie which is wild uh, he, he plays like one of the, uh, one of the, the, the scumbag, you know, gang member guys. Uh, we, we get like a new big bad. He's this guy, uh, for, uh, Judah played by Richard Brooks, who's, uh, another, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of fucked up. He's kind of like a, a knockoff version of Tony Todd. He's, he's like this like tall, skinny black dude that has like this incredible fucking voice. Like, I'm sure I, I'd have to look it up, but I'm sure I've heard his voice like somewhere. But he's he's like this like scumbag drug dealer dude that it's it's fairly random. Like, I, I think Ash and his son witness a bunch of Judas dudes like basically murdering somebody out on the street. So to make it so there's no witnesses, they kill those. They shoot those two and tie them up and throw them into the fucking bay kind of um it's 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 all very similar it's it's all kind of treading fairly familiar territory uh iggy iggy pops pretty great and he has like a very like uh <laughs> he's, he's got like blonde hair and he's wearing like fairly thick eyeliner and 
looks kind of like a, like a mom that would yell at like a Walmart employee, <laughs> basically. And there's also a really weird choice where they play a Stooges song while Iggy Pop is like, like, like I, I think he's walking into like a porno theater where one of his fellow gang members has just been arrested and the needle drop that they use in that is, uh, I think the song's called Now, now I Want to Be Your Dog. Okay. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> like, but, yeah, he's easily the most recognizable Stooges song, and for some reason they chose to use it while Iggy Pop is on camera, which I thought was a bizarre fucking choice. Thomas Jane apparently pops up in this somewhere. I don't remember who the hell he plays. He plays a character named Nemo, who I assume is probably one of the other other scumbaggy gang member characters. Doesn't really sound like I'm missing much having not watched the second one. Not that it's like the other ones that came after it, but it seems like a series that maybe could have been uh, left alone. Yeah, I think I think these were just like really these are cheap cheap cash ins, like definitely direct to video type shit, which uh, made Miramax a lot of fucking money in the late '90s and early 2000s. Uh, just appealing straight to that uh, name recognition, direct to video type of shit. Uh, the City of Angels isn't a, I wouldn't call this a terrible movie. It's definitely nowhere near as good as the original. Uh, I think the biggest, like the biggest downgrade is Vincent Perez himself. Like he's nowhere near as interesting or as charming as Brandon Lee. Like he's, he's kind of, he's, he just doesn't really do anything interesting in this movie whatsoever. And he doesn't have like a nearly as much screen presence and, yeah, it's it's kind of it's it's kind of just a waste like the whole <laughs> the whole thing like they they really could have I mean the comics I, from what I've read do a pretty good job of re you know of introducing new characters that embody basically kind of the same thing. Like I I guess if you want to be kind of a detractor you could say that like they you know, basically just do the same fucking story over and over again. But it kind of works because you can kind of change things that like it seems a little bit more fresh, but still has like a lot of the same, uh, you know, look and feel to it, basically. And I don't really see a whole lot of reason why they couldn't have done that with the movies, except for I think maybe audiences weren't quite ready to, you know, have. Like, because it was just, it was so well known that Brandon Lee had died on the first one and obviously wouldn't be back to do any sequels that, like, I don't think audiences are ready for somebody to replace him. I think the movie was fairly well liked when it came out. And I think a lot of people just thought it was in poor taste to jump in, like, not even a couple years later and, like, have somebody else playing him, even though. It's totally something that like works in the comics. Like it's it's only Eric Draven in the original ones, and then it's different people throughout the rest of the the reboots and reimaginings of the series kind of deal. So, um, yeah, you're not really missing anything. Not watching City of Angels, I thought it was interesting, and uh, they almost they it, it had potential, but like, yeah, you're you're kind of fighting a losing battle trying to replace an actor that has died that was like fairly well loved in in the original so yeah that's 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 pretty much the long and short of it you don't really need to i would be kind of curious to see like what the fucking tv series looks like nowadays because i'm sure it's probably aged horribly and was probably a cheap cash in just like the sequel the movie sequels i'm just curious how how bad it might be but uh tv series is almost fucking impossible to find anywhere streaming uh, like I said, that third sequel isn't playing on any streaming services. It's like basically unlisted on Amazon Prime. They're like, this video is no longer available. And yeah, I didn't didn't want to fork over four dollars to watch the terrible looking Edward Furlong one because that one looked really cheap and really bad. Well, maybe now that who owns or oh, is it Paramount? You said owns the property now. Uh, the last bunch of them were all put up by Miramax. So, who, but you said you uh, saw them on Paramount Plus. The oh yes, movies. yeah, yep. Um, so, and I know who because so one of those company. Oh well, no, Miramax is still going on, as far as I know. I don't know. I sort of 
stopped paying attention. I was going to say, are you saying that the Bob and Harvey Weinstein did something crass and shitty? Uh Uh-huh. This, yeah, this is (laughs) one on a long, long list. You're here to say, (laughs) but... (laughs) I mean, eventually Disney will own everything and they'll put everything out again so they can make money again. So yeah. that, that'll be when you watch The Crow is when it's a it's a ride at Universal Studios <laughs> and it's on Disney Plus or whatever the fuck it'll eventually be. But uh, well, and they've been talking about they've been trying to get a fucking reboot off the ground for like many many years like i think most recently jason momoa was attached to play the crow in some kind of remake and thankfully they've thought better of it like i mean i don't really it's i don't again it's something like it could be really interesting because i think there's a lot of like room for reinterpretation of the character and you can kind of do the same thing but different like over and over and over again like a great many comic book characters that will have much longer lives than either of us will uh but also yeah i I would imagine i would have to imagine that jason momoa probably thinks it's a little bit in poor taste and that the original the crow movie has aged just fine it's there's absolutely nothing wrong with it there's like a couple little like slightly dodgy blue screen shots and like i said playing spot the fake shemp is kind of distracting but other than that, I don't think the original Crow movie is aged like particularly badly. I think it still holds up on its own, and like people still fucking love it. So why 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 dink around with that? You know, because money. Because like, money. Yeah, artistically, no reason. There's plenty of other stories, and all that. But yeah, I, eventually it'll it'll get redone. I know Jason Momoa is a fan of comics but yeah i i saw that he had been attached but nothing happened and he's moved on he would have been like a berserker crow because he's 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 pretty big and buff compared to all the other interpretations i mean yeah with fucking iggy pop like <laughs> that dude's a zero percent body fat and looks like a fucking skeleton a lot of the time yeah anyway i think that was the episode i think yeah i think that I think that about wraps it up. Yeah, you know, this, this was a good one to talk about because I wasn't super, like I said, I was pretty familiar with the movies, but not super familiar with the comics. And uh, yeah, definitely go check out that episode of Cursed Cursed Films. At least watch the one that's about the crow. It's super duper fucking sad, but uh, it kind of explains some of the stuff a little bit, a little bit better than I could. I, I think it's like thirty minutes too. It's it's like a pretty quick watch, but um, yeah, I, I think I probably will still end up tracking down that collected graphic novel of the original uh four issue james james abar run because uh the the more modern ones i was reading i really liked i really enjoy the art style I, that, that's another thing that i think appeals to me now more now than uh you know when i was like a teenager like when i was first starting to get into comics is, is black and white art is kind of an under appreciated uh art form and like some of my favorite comics now all these years later black and white like i really love the original bunch of walking dead comics and like there's there's a really gorgeous uh comic adaption of night of the living dead that came out uh like early mid 90s that i've since tracked down like i think i own like three different versions of that one but the art style reminds me a lot of the crow there's this like all all the great black and white art tricks that you can do like with you know crosshatch and watercolor and negative space and stuff like that I, they they did with the night of the living dead comic it's it's really fucking good i hope i still have a copy of that over here somewhere but um yeah this uh this was a good one i i think we'll probably we'll jump into something a little more traditional for for the december episode i i, I do like the fact that you you pointed out to me putting this out in november you're like well it's kind of a bird month at least for us americans so uh, happy Thanksgiving. Watch the fucking crow. Uh, maybe stay home because you don't want to give your family fucking COVID, which will leave you in a two week depression and you'll be starting to identify with Eric Draven, maybe a little bit more than you should. Uh, 
definitely if you're listening to this on the main psycho semantic feed uh consider supporting the legion podcast patreon i i I, i'm a member i get my podcasts uh way before they go out on the main feeds and sometimes you get fun little exclusive stuff and i think i pay like five bucks a month for it so uh it's it's totally worth it um i unfortunately had to pass on uh Bo invited me to he he's got me in like a group uh group chat for his show the dark parade i'm pretty sure it's called we we did night of the demons in october which was a lot of fun to listen to and yeah that was on the patreon feed like a good uh, two or three weeks before it went out to the main legion feed so yeah if you're into that sort of thing you'll you'll, you'll see some familiar faces on some of those shows and i i forget what the hell series he was doing for uh the one that i had to pass on but he he, he sent he sent out the ask like between like me and six or eight other people i think if they wanted to come and be guest hosts on it the day that i got my fucking uh covid diagnosis so uh, i unfortunately had to pass on that one but i i will be back on some of those shows and obviously we're gonna try and get back on track and do one of these comic book movie shows once a month ish. So, um, yeah, we, I, I guess we'll probably jump into something Marvel for the next go around. I don't know if we're, if we're still doing the, uh, uh, the, the MCU movies in chronological order. I think Captain Marvel is up next. I mean, unless you count Eternals is kind of a weird one. Cause it jumps all over the place. Like, spanning like a thousand fucking years like in in terms of time so i mean you could make the argument that that one probably is now the 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 first one in chronological order but and, and i'm not sure where black widow falls into any of this either because that's a fucking prequel i think it takes place in the well i think it takes place it, well obviously it's definitely before end game but i forget kind of where it's at as far as that goes but uh yeah i don't know we'll, we'll talk about it maybe we'll abandon the chronological order and pick something else but uh might might be captain marvel for next month we will find out and yeah if if we miss a month we will try not to miss two is kind of how we're doing this tune in next time for the adventures of Insert whatever, thing. The f- whatever the fuck this yeah. show's called. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you. And you.